News First, face to face with Shalom Benedesic. Hello there, very good evening and welcome to another edition of Face to Face. Today we are joined by the Deputy Legal Secretary of the Samagi Jana Balavege, Attorney at Law Tharaka Nanayakara, a uh, young leader, of course, representing uh, the Samagi Jana Balavege. A very good evening, Tharaka, and welcome to the show. Good evening to you, Shalan. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Tharaka, for joining us on our program. Tharaka, one of the main issues that we really have in this country is the fact that we don't have enough youth representation. Now, when I say youth, uh, I don't mean people in their 20s because uh, we are not there yet. Maybe parliaments in, in, in more developed states have members in their 20s, but we have just very few. And our parliament has uh, very, very senior members, uh, very little youth representation. Now, Sri Lanka has really come out of its shell with the economic crisis, with the Aragalea, and, and with the struggles that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have realized that appointing same old people over and over and over again when they've failed us countless number of times is pointless. However, in a political sense, that does not mean that we can just go and throw out the entire 225 as the ret rhetoric once was. But the main concern that a lot of people have right now is that even if they do elect youth representatives, young politicians, new faces into parliament, it's the same old people who will be running the show. Is this not true? Well, Shalan, I think you're raising a really very valid and a very important point. Uh, youth representation in Sri Lanka has actually, if you take the historical data, if you carefully look at it, might have even declined, hmm. other than the dynastical politics. Hmm. Because uh, if you look at the 77 parliament, you had a blend of mature and young politicians who came in for the first time. Then you look at uh, Mr. Premadas's government in 1989. So many young people, for instance, people like the Satanayak, mm. who were university students, who were first generation politicians. So uh, then 1994, Mrs. Bandarnayaka, Mrs. Bandarnayaka's uh, uh, group it had mm. Nalandel Lawless, Dallas Allah Perumas, uh, Dilan Pereras, mm. several. I mean, they have lost their political, some of them have lost their political validity now, but there was a nice, they were there at the time, young generation. So now, when you look at it, yes, what you say is correct. Uh, the young MPs are there, young provincial councillors may be there, but the parties are run by very senior leadership. Hmm. Now, relatively, when you take SJB, our leader, Honorable Sajid Premadas, is a relatively younger bracket. You take the President, Honorable His Excellency Ranil Vikramasinghe, he is over 70. Hmm. You take the Prime Minister, classmate of the President, he is over 70. So, in all the other professions, all the other vocations, 70 is the time to let go. Hmm. But here, 70 is the time that they still hold on to it mm. and you can't totally blame them because most of them are elected mm. if people elect them that's democracy however I firmly believe that youth should be given more opportunities not only at the local level not only at the provincial level but at the national level and they should be given responsibility to run ministries to run the political machinery and eventually rise to leadership because that is a trend Shalan we see mm. you take uh, Justin Trudeau or you take uh, the French president, most of these people are young people but as you very correctly said, we cannot, uh, you say, take Justin Darden, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, a young mother. Mm. So this is the trend but Sri Lanka being Sri Lanka will have to take things a little slow but mm. I feel it's high time and as you correctly pointed out with the Aragale we have broken a lot of barriers. Mm. but. Uh, we had to see for what reason. It has to be for good reason. Mm. Uh, it's good that we managed to chase away a president who was functioning against the public will. But from there, where do we proceed? Now we have a president who is again backed by the same crowd, the same Rajapaksha clan. This is not what the people wanted from Aragalia. But having said that, this has to be a democratic struggle. This has to be a peaceful, democratic but a very strong struggle to put right people in right places so that Sri Lanka 
rises from the ashes because you can't expect miracles from a government that doesn't have a mandate hmm. now you see when you look at the back issue which will i suppose speak at length hmm. uh, on the next round uh, people are already taking taking up to streets hmm. because there no political mandate there no political validity hmm. so therefore it's an election year that's coming up it's up to the people it's up to the general public to do what is necessary to meet the need of the hour but tarkana speaking specifically on 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 the issue of vat uh, now there are certain things that the government will come out right and say uh, there are certain things that they really can't say to the general public uh, the vat it appears to be at least uh, sort of a move to appease certain conditions of the IMF the IMF hasn't specifically said increase vat increase this and increase that however they've set targets for the government to meet and the government has failed to meet a few targets and these measures of course uh, are part of the ongoing discussions with the IMF to secure much uh, the much needed tranche of the IMF the second tranche of uh, their EFF disbursement to Sri Lanka so leaving all politics aside i mean i understand that the general public is severely affected by this i am severely affected by this uh, but uh, since you are representing the opposition um, i would put to you the fact that these measures are necessary one could say given the situation of the country now i know the opposition is advocating for a 20000 rupee salary hike for state sector employees but i believe it was just a few years ago that your very own parliamentarian uh, dr harsha de silva who said diao diao ki yana kohinda din ne so <laughs> how would you answer that question if i pose it to you now well salan i i still stand with uh, dr harsha statement and i believe he will also stand with his statement this is may not be a time to demand but a government servant survives on a salary between 35 to 50000 mm. a lower grade government uh, servant mm. they had to take the bus mm. they had to uh, eat a packet of lunch mm. maybe you speak skip breakfast you eat lunch that's how people survive today mm. even to do that and to feed a family of four mm. you can't even go on for two weeks with the salary that they get mm. and what can they do in addition can they go and uh, engage in any other profession or vocation those are also expressly restricted when you are in the public service mm. right so how else either the government must intervene and bring down the cost of living mm. or they must give an alternative to the uh, general public not only the government servants government servants are but one bracket mm. you get more uh, you 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 get a wider class of people who are daily wage wage earners mm. who can't even meet not not three square meals who can't even meet two the cost of two square meals now mm. I personally know I come from uh, the southern province originally so I personally know say estate workers may be uh, farmers may mm. be uh, daily other daily wage wage earners uh, industrial workers so these people are going through a very difficult time mm. so government is saying we are giving 5000 like this we are giving uh, what is that uh, instead of samurdhi they are giving an aswasuma aswasuma uh, they will talk about all this but people are in difficulty so as an opposition we have to speak on behalf of the people mm. because looking at people's difficulty we are not deaf we are not blind and we are not heartless mm. to support a government who is blatantly disregarding the public will now as you said maybe there are imf conditions generally to in, uh, to increase the public revenue hmm. they wouldn't say put 18% vat on petrol hmm. they wouldn't say put 18% uh, on uh, the green leaf the uh, to to affect the tea industry hmm. to tea small holders uh, uh, and tea factories they will have to pay 18% vat from january hmm. for your uh, petrol you pump to your car or for the petrol uh, youth from a village maybe in tissa maharama pumps to his motor bicycle it's 69 rupees more hmm. from january so IMF do not spell out to do this exactly so they have to widen the tax net how how how, how tight uh, how tight is our tax net right now mm. professionals are paying taxes uh, 
employees pa private sector employees are playing paying taxes at a mm, as a mammoth rate of 36% on their total earnings mm. including their transport including the other perquisites mm. all this but how have they widened the tax net have they captured the uh, businesses the small uh, the the uh, yeah, sole proprietorships the partnerships mm. how, how many have they captured so once i i believe now that you refer to dr harsha de silva uh, he said this is a very lazy tax uh, policy that sri lanka has mm. i i i totally stand by that because instead of widening the tax and that's what you must do instead of widening the tax net you're taxing the people who are already paying taxes. exactly you're squeezing the necks of the people who have already kept it on the line for the country i mean i'm i think they are providing human service to the country by paying 36% tax that's more than one th- more than one third of your earnings hmm. you take a university lecturer for instance they are paying 36% tax they may have maybe getting a salary of couple of hundred thousand rupees they may have a car lease to pay they may have a housing loan to pay how many people have rescheduled their loans because of this uh, tax burden mm. if you speak to a bank if you speak to a finance company uh, they will confirm what i say even i have rescheduled my financial facilities mm. because you can't afford to pay mm. so it's a uh, it's a matter of looking at it with a wider angle with a little warmth in your heart and a matter of negotiating and a matter of implementing stronger policies mm. we are just talking about tax here so mm. that's the, that's why i gave the example of widening the tax net so there's a lot they can do without doing that they are just putting the blame now i heard honorable shahan say missing a state minister of finance yesterday when the vat uh, uh, amendment bill was mm. brought in he said we have to pass this before the 12th if not we won't if not we won't, won't get, get the, the imf trance fine we understand that we need to comply with the demand i mean we are not uh, sjb we not that uh, we are we have not uh, uh, said we should not have gone to imf we uh, you were the first our, to say our finance team dr harsha disilla mr ram vikramrath mr kabir hashi mr basajit premada the leader we were the first to say one year ago before they went then gotabe rajapaksha and his goons and his two just laughed it off saying mm. we will never go to imf imf is uh, uh, western uh, conspiracy in total that's what they said but now we are saying you go to imf but you negotiate mm. you don't bow down and say yes to everything to do that salan you have to have a mandate mm. now his excellency the president or this uh, government which is backed by mostly slpp parliamentarians do not have a clear mandate after the aragale the entire political dynamic of this country have changed hmm. just totally changed so if they get into uh, an election now hmm. they won't even get one third of the seats that they have all the, right now in this parliament hmm. they know that very well that is why despite our agitations they are not even having the local government elections they are not going for a when when a country is in difficulty you see you take england for example when when there are political issues when there are economic issues when the government of the day can't meet those challenges the prime minister will resign they'll go for elections hmm. so they can't go for snap elections they can't uh, test uh, their mandate because they know they do not have a mandate But the, Tarek, the real issue here is now you said that you are speaking on behalf of the people speaking on behalf of the hardships of the people now correct me if i'm wrong but it was the same government of uh, or, or the current uh, party that is in power the SLPP headed at the time by uh, uh, president uh, former president Mahinda Rajapaksa who were vehemently against increasing taxes on fuel they rode to parliament on bicycles in protest for increasing 2 rupees i believe at the time 2 rupees correct then when the taxing formula came in they were against it it was their gamban pillar who led the charge and uh, now of course they flip sides and the, the the argument at the time was that it increases the burden on the people food i still remember very vividly uh parliamentarian vimal veera once again getting up on stage and reading all the concessions that the people will get 5000 rupees off this 5000 rupees off that 10000 rupee allowance and all of those things so can you realistically say that these promises of the pledges and you're saying that state sector employees need at least 20000 salary increment 
cost of living needs to come down. Do you think these are very general statements, very little specifics? Of course, I understand there's no election, there's no uh, well, space to put out a manifesto, and then in such manifesto, you're, you will detail what exactly you're going to do. But even these broad statements, do you think they are too far reaching? And do you think you'll be able to deliver if and when the people deem you worthy to hold power? Yeah, Sharan, one, one correction. I did not say that state sector employees have to be given 20,000. Mm. I'm saying not only the state sector employees, but mm. all the other downtrodden people who are suffering, not only even, even the low middle classes, mm. the middle classes uh, day by day de depleting mm. because they are becoming poor. Mm. The upper middle class is becoming middle class or low middle class mm. because we are going through a huge negative transition right mm. now. So what I am saying is when you are in governance, you must govern with the best interests of the people in heart, at mm. heart. So either it may be salary increments or it may be the bringing down of the cost of living mm. or at least give a concession on essential items. Modalities can be determined mm. but in principle first we must have our principles and policies right then we can go to specifics in principle i am saying mm. people's needs people's difficulties must be understood by the government of the day and met by the government of the day mm. that is what i am trying to advocate if there is a burden uh, on the economy uh, in giving 20000 well don't give mm. but give a concession Mm. to the state sector employee uh, for the tea school teacher who resides in Gaul and who has to teach in a school in Hambantu to give her a concession mm. transfer her to Gaul these, these, are exa these are practical things you must do mm. it's not about the, so that way you'll cut their lodging costs, boarding costs, food costs, transport costs all that mm. so you meet them halfway because already the government if I'm not mistaken has given a 10,000 increment from the budget in April in April and people are saying on the way here I was just listening to uh, News First 7 live uh, on YouTube and then people are saying we can't wait till April we can't start till April mm -hmm. so who are we to deny that Shala? Mm -hmm. can you deny that mm -hmm. people are in difficulty can I deny that so policy makers must make policy where these things are possible we are not saying like Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksha did or Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksha did to take away the entire pay tax. 18% pay tax was there, everyone was happily paying it mm. for no profound reason. Uh, for the reasons based on to them, they just went and took off the entire pay tax. Where are we now? We are paying double on that. Mm. So I'm not talking about hasty, politically manipulated. Uh, economically unsound decisions mm. talking about real policy mm. so when you are making policy you must look at the difficulties of the people and make sure that concessions are granted there are aspects uh, there are certain uh, certain components of the society who can afford to pay the 36 percent tax mm. Uh, there are certain industries who are gaining super profits maybe they can be uh, levied an extra uh, super profit tax those are all right so long as you don't affect an industry's economic competitiveness mm. you can tax them that is how a government is to survive mm. we are not telling the government not to tax mm. we are telling the government to make policies so that people's difficulties are taken account of mm. That is all we are saying. We are not saying we give 20,000 or give this or give that. Mm. The modality the government of the day has to decide, mm. not us. Uh, Tharaka, another concern among the general public, of course, now that we are paying taxes and it's our money that's being used. I think usually uh, what was promoted was, you know, the government did this, the government did that, the government built this. But now people are really beginning to feel that it's their money that's going into all of these. So. Uh, on the aspect of expenses of the government, uh, recently I was watching the debate uh, on the expenditure heads uh, for former presidents and I, I realized that there are millions, hundreds of millions, two to three hundred million uh, allocated for each former president. And among those former presidents, two former presidents are currently parliamentarians and they are also drawing salaries as parliamentarians, they are also drawing privileges as parliamentarians. So. When that is the case, 
could one really justify these expenses? I mean, the whole reason for uh, a former president to be given a certain amount of expenses is because usually you'd expect a president to retire exactly. after his term in office and exactly. he needs to maintain a certain level of life. I understand that, but even for that, two to three hundred million a year, uh, I think that's 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 just unfathomable for a person who lives on on, a, on an average wage. So, uh, why is there such a huge level of insensitivity, or is there something that's behind the scenes that I can't see as a commoner? Well, Salan, I think uh, one I can't remember exactly who one of the famous U.S. presidents once said. I believe it was Barack Obama. I'm not sure. If you can't do it in ter two terms, you can't do it at all, hmm. right? So, this gentleman, maybe Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa, maybe Mr. Maitri Pala Sirisena. Mr. Sirisena, of course, had the opportunity of running only for one term. Hmm. But once you become president, you have reached the pinnacle of your political career, hmm. as you very correctly said. Like good old Mr. Jayazawadana did, like Mrs. Chandrika Bandarnayaka did, with whatever the criticisms we might have on, people might have on her, they retired from politics. Hmm. And they did not engage in electoral politics. Hmm. Because once you reach the pinnacle, you don't go back, once you go to the A-level class, you don't go back to the Montessori. <laughs> Simple as that. So these people are greedy for power. These people are hungry for power. And they contest, people also elect them, fine, they're still popular in their own uh, small electorates, but there must be some common decency to give up one privilege or the other. But being in, uh, being, uh, I always say, being Sri Lanka, being Sri Lanka, those common decencies, common courtesies do not exist. So we must entrench these things in the constitution. Pro presidential privileges must be restricted in a way. I believe I we will suggest to our leadership because uh, there has to be a method to madness at least <laughs> at least at the least right mm. so I believe presidential privileges can stand because every country a former president is mm. as you said a certain standard of living has to be maintained that is fine but if you are coming back to elected office you must give up all those privileges and then run for office mm. so things like this so these shall and boil back to our original proposition mm. policy without having strong policies, principles, values. Hmm. If we come into power and we don't do this, there's no point in us doing engaging in politics. So we have, we, are, we strongly believe in um, Honorable Sajid Premadas's leadership and his team, hmm. like Harsha, Iran, Kabir, this vibrant political team does not exist in any other political camp. Hmm. I'm uh, proudly saying that. So this is a team that we are going to feel, mm. not an individual, under the leadership of Honorable uh, Sajid Premdas and this team, we want to make things right in this country for once. Mm. And as young uh, activists in politics, uh, the purpose we are here, purpose we are supporting a political party, the purpose we are actively engaged in uh, politics at a certain level, even behind the scenes, is to put these things right. Mm. And we will fight for that. We will talk about corruption. We have drawn up uh, white papers on how to fight corruption, recovery of stolen assets. Mm. Uh, we have drafted a white, white paper, myself and another colleague of mine, which Mr. Sajid Premdas has fully endorsed. Mm. So we have done things and we want to continue to do the right thing mm. for the country. And as SJB, we believe that we can. Historically, Sri Lanka has always been while the existence of a few minor parties, largely a two-party system. First it was, you know, the SLFP, the UNP, then there were factions, breakaways, alliances formed, but it was all centered around these two big players in the politics in Sri Lanka. Post Aragalea, people are looking at alternatives. Now come the next presidential election, which is uh, the first election, at least according to the president, uh, that will come up next year. There are several presidential candidates. Uh, then there are uh, the minor political parties like uh, the Jataka Janabalaveke also coming up. And there are people looking at these alternatives as well. So their argument is that these two political parties or these two massive camps have been in power since the beginning of Sri Lanka's uh, post-independence. Uh, governance of the country and they failed us 
So now we are looking for an alternative. How would you respond to one of them? Um, Shalan, firstly, Samagizana Balavegia or the SJB is a very young political party. True, we have certain values that we have carried from our mother party, United mm -hmm. National Party, but we are more open minded in our thinking. Mm -hmm. Our principles, we believe in a social market economy mm -hmm. and we truly believe in a social market economy. Certain political parties, I don't want to mention names because it's a conversation between you and I, if it mm. was a debate I would have, uh, certain political parties say they are believing in social market economy, the, but they talk about state industry, state run industries in, two state run industries in each district. Mm. They talk about centrally regulating the financial markets, mm. like like uh, Mr. Gota Rajapaksa's government uh, tried to control the exchange rate. Mm. So these are fallacy so you had to have some experience in governance maybe either experience in governance in the public sector or private sector mm. where do we find those kind of alternatives nowhere except in the SGB so let them come it's very healthy this competition is extremely healthy it may be it may be some other political part it may be a youth movement there, there may be so many organizations forming up we will mm. see more we will mm. see entrepreneurs coming in, we will see businessmen coming in, we will mm. see professionals coming in saying I will be the president, I will run for parliament, All mm. these, this competition is held, there is no problem. Mm. People will have more choice. Mm. Like we believe in a free market, mm. uh, there will be ample supply mm. uh, and people can uh, demand what they want. Mm. Right? But end of the day, we must look at when we are looking for a set up people to govern you for mm. the next five years. We are looking for a president to run this country for the next five years. Mm. We are looking at a person and a team who are going to take up a very, very uphill task. So experience counts, mm. professional background counts, uh, leadership proven track record of leadership counts mm. because everyone can challenge make speeches. Mm. Everyone, every politician has, has the gift of the gap. They mm. can stand up and criticize and say, we will put these things right. Sp speak in a very broad sense. Mm. But we should be smart enough to look at their general policies, principles and mm. see how best they are going to address this problem. Mm. So as SJB, we have put our alternatives. We have come out with our economic blueprint, mm. uh, two versions. 2021 and 22 mm. and we have placed before the general public of this country this is what we are going to do mm. certain things I won't shy away certain things that President Vikram Singh carries out we can agree mm. but what we can't agree is this lack of regard for the people who are suffering in this country Mm. Because they are an important component, the farmers, the uh, laborers, the daily wage mm. earners, the low bracket public servants, they form the core of our society. Mm. We can't ignore them, we can't ignore their plight, mm. we can't ignore their uh, difficulty in finding not three but even two square meals for their children. Mm. We can't ignore the uh, requirement uh, of school books and material for their children and the lack of it. So. We must govern, we must put things right. We all might have to make sacrifices. When I pay my 36% taxes as a professional, I do it happily. Mm -hmm. I do it happily because I feel this is, as you said, maybe these are the requirements of the IMF, maybe this is what, the, this is the sacrifice we have to do mm -hmm. to help put this economy right. But I would want, as you would want, as the general tax paying public would want to be for it to be utilized for the right purposes. I think the Aruka, to yeah. put it in the most simplest of words, uh, people didn't care too much when money was stolen, when money was looted, when billions were just squandered uh, by previous governments because it never came out of their pocket or not enough came out of their pocket. Correct. But now since the too much uh, is coming out of their pocket, they really feel it and um, maybe, just maybe, this is the kind of push that Sri Lankans need to realize, look here, we're going on the right, a wrong path. Uh, it's time we got on 
the right track and uh, well it's best that it happened now instead of later on uh, which would have brought uh, more suffering more pain okay. to the general public of Sri Lanka at least looking at uh, it in that positive light will end tonight's show thank you very much Taraganana Kara for joining us on our program thank you very much to all our viewers out there for tuning in to another episode of face to face of course um, next year is an election year it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to elect the right people into power not for popularity not for personal gains but for the betterment of Sri Lanka as a whole thank you very much god bless good night <laughs>